All right, we're on. Chip, okay, let me, I gotta fix that because Chip, you appear smaller than us. There you go, better. You're gonna squeeze in here. All right, so we are live tonight with our special guest, Chip. You hear me, right? I do hear you. Mr. Chip Coffee, the legend, the myth. Um, you guys might know him from Kindred Spirits, Paranormal State, Psychic Kids. Um, thank you so much, Chip for doing this. I, I really, really, really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Now, I talked about like people in the field who, um, who are genuine, good people. And Chip, you are top of that list oh, for me. Thank you. Anyway, thank you. Um, you know, I met Chip probably about four or five years ago through Power Unity um, and got to know him through that. Chip and I have had many conversations on the phone where he's read me the riot act about many things <laughs> and offered me some valuable uh, advice about different things. But even more than that, um, when my mom was going through when she was passing and I was feeling what I was feeling, I reached out to Chip uh, via text and he called me, you know, the next day and stayed on the phone with me for an hour or more just talking to me, letting me talk and trying to, you know, talk me through, you know, what, you know, what he had gone through and other experiences. And it, it meant the world to me, Chip, you know that. I, I can't convey enough how much that call meant to me. It really. Well, you know, that's what we should do if we have feelings for someone, if we are friends with them or they're our loved ones, like you've been to me. And that is when, when people are going through a tough time, you're there for them. That's just that's that's just being a good, solid person. It's being human. And, and you know, yeah. I've met a lot of people through the years doing this and a lot of people that are on TV. And, and like I said, um, you know, Dustin reached out to me, a few other people. And again, it's it's again, the human part of it. I'm not just some guy paying you money to show up at a convention where you do your thing and, you know, where you go to the next one. You're not that type of person. And no, yeah. I've always, I've always really, very much been about relationships with people, yeah. establishing good, solid relationships with people, because, you know, that's, I, I want to say that's the way it should be in every instance. It, it, unfortunately, that's not the way it always is, but right. that's the way, I, that's the way I try to make it. So those of you who don't know, I know a lot of Chip Coffee fans are on here. You don't know who this guy is with the, uh, the hat and the, the shirt. Um, we're New Jersey Paranormal. My name is John. This is my partner, Chris. Um, Chip has agreed to come on for an interview, so we're going to get to the interview. Um, Chip, we're going to start at the beginning. Um, you're a psychic medium. Everybody knows that. Um, how old were you when you first started to notice that you had mediumship abilities, and, and what sort of things were you experiencing? All right, we really need to go back and forth between deciding if we want to talk about the psychic part or the medium part. Or Let's both. go medium part. Let's go medium. I, well, I've always been psychic. I should put that out okay. there right away. But the mediumship did not start until I was in my 40s. What? And yeah, absolutely. Wow. So, yeah, it started when I was in my 40s. I actually was working at that time in the travel industry. And uh, one of my coworkers in the travel industry um, had a brother. I, we didn't know each other well. We knew each other sort of in passing. I knew that she had an interest in spirituality. We had talked a few times, like in the lunchroom or in the break room. And I knew she had a brother who had passed and she had an interest in spirituality. And one day while we were um, leaving work at the same time, her brother, who, is, who had died, started talking to me inside my head. And I thought I'd gone crazy. And when I told her what I was picking up, she confirmed that those were things that she'd experienced with her brother and he was very specific about a lot of things and that sort of flung the door open but that didn't occur for me until the year 2001. Well I don't think I've ever heard somebody say that they didn't have that yeah that. early on in life and it sort of developed. Did something happen that created that and opened that door or? I don't know exactly I think you know as I said, my coworker, her name was Pam, um, and she, she and I were just talking about spirituality a few times, had, had talked about spirituality a few times, and, you know, at one point in time, we talked about John Edward, who is a very famous medium, and, you know, it, it, 
it sort of evolved from there with with us meeting at that time and place, I guess. I was being led to that spot to where her brother, who had died, I guess, at, probably at that point, she was in her 30s, late 30s, and it had been half or more of her life ago. So it had been at least 20 years since he died. And he started telling me things inside my head, and that was just the way it began. Wow, that's wow. crazy. So prior to that, no paranormal experiences. Did you have an interest in the paranormal prior to? Oh, I've been I always surrounded by the paranormal. Always, always. I grew up in a haunted house when I was a kid. Oh, paranormal you did? Stuff and, yeah, paranormal stuff and supernatural stuff has always followed me around. So, and, and the fact that I was psychic and knew things about people, places, and things you know, that was, that was all a part of it. So I guess the next step in the process was the, the mediumship and being able to talk to the dead. Um, I don't think I would have handled it well if it had happened to me when I was younger. I think I would have, it would have caused a lot of confusion and difficulty and problems in my life. So I, I, I think that, that the gift manifested itself at a really appropriate time when I was mature enough to deal with it. And it had enough worldly experience to where I had had a better understanding of both the, the, the spiritual and paranormal as well as a lot of life experience. So you did grow up in a haunted house as a kid? I did. But you weren't able to communicate with them at that point. They were just, what yeah. sort of things were going on? In your you know, home? Nothing, nothing bad, nothing malicious. You know, lights would turn on. Okay. You'd, hear, you'd hear footsteps in the house. Doors would open by themselves. There was a coal spot in the house. You know, we played with the Ouija board, consulted a Ouija board. <laughs> um, no, 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 I don't believe let's go here. Nothing bad happened. Okay. Absolutely zero bad happened with the Ouija board. So as a matter of fact, it told us things about the family that was haunting the house, the former tenants of the house that we were able later to verify. So wow. you know, it was a very good experience with us consulting a talking board. It was very, it was very positive. I and think it has to do with your intent when you're doing anything like more. that. But Consult did you ever think about going back to that house now with your abilities and seeing who these people were? Oh, I know. Oh, I oh really? 100%. It was the family that lived there prior to us. There was only oh, one cool. family that lived in the house prior to us. Wow. An, Irish, an Irish immigrant family named Murphy. And those people, those people are very close to me at, at, even now. I mean, I, they, I have a picture of one of them hanging in my foyer here in my house. That's crazy. Wow. So um, I ask a lot of people this when it comes to the paranormal, because I think your religious background and views kind of factor into what kind of investigator and thing, you know, your beliefs as far as spirits. My, my belief in spirits comes because I'm not, I was, I was baptized. I am Catholic if I have to put something on paper, but I never went to church. Um, you know, my belief is, I do believe there's a God, but everything else is kind of iffy to me. Were you raised Catholic or what, what's your background as far as religion? I was raised, I was raised Catholic. Catholic. Okay. So were you very spiritual? I mean, do you believe in angels and demons? Yes. Really? Mm -hmm. See, I have a hard time with the... Um, I'm with you. I, I I talk to a lot of people about this. Demons are, is a tough one for me because you haven't experienced it. Yeah, I mean, you know, demonic and, and I don't know. It's such a hard thing for me to when kinda... you when you've experienced it, you won't have to ask. You won't when have you, to. When you've seen what I've seen in my lifetime, you'll you'll you would you would yeah. you'll know you'll know. Yep. Well, I believe you. I, I grew up I grew up in the Catholic faith, and of course, you hear a lot about angels. And then, you know, the, the flip side of an angel is a demon. So right. I, um, I had heard about demons, but I never experienced anything in that realm. And when I did Paranormal State, it was kind of baptism by fire <laughs> because the first case that I did on Paranormal State was a demonic case. And there were several that followed that. Mm -hmm. And so it was, a, it was a quick learning curve for me when that show was on the air. All right, we're, I don't want to jump too far ahead because we're going to get into the, the Paranormal State. Um, we were talking about, you know, 40, you know, one years old, where you, you 40, developed. 40 years old. I, was, I was older than 41, but thank you for taking shape. <laughs> well, you're only 48 now, right? Yeah, right. Uh -huh. uh, do you believe that um, people are born with the type of gift, uh, more so the mediumship? Um, 
or do you believe it's something that can be developed? Do you think we all have it? I, I hear a lot of different theories on mediumship. I believe, that we're, all, I believe that we're all psychic. Psychic simply means knowing things that, knowing things about people, places, and things that you don't know using your five human senses. Hmm. That's all it really is. It's a, it's like a sixth sense, although not like in the, in the manner of the movie. But it's more like, it, it basically is having access to information or, or energy that you can't get using your five human senses. Mediumship is a totally different animal. Mediumship. Mediumship is like having a PhD in psychic stuff or intuitive stuff. So I don't believe everyone is a medium. I strongly don't believe everyone is a medium, but I do believe that everyone has some level and there's a large spectrum of different levels of ability, but I believe everyone has some level of psychic ability. Like hmm. intuition. I mean, it, 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 yes, here's an example. I mean, how often have you thought of someone, as someone's crossed your mind, a friend, a loved one, whatever, and then shortly thereafter, that person contacts you, either email or you run into them or you get a text message or a phone call or whatever. And you yeah. know that in a way, I think that's just like somehow energetically connecting with that person. Yeah. Just like today when we were watching that uh, 60 Days In and I said, that guy looks more like he's a chef than he does a corrections officer. And you said, I was thinking the same thing just now. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's happens what happens when, when you're with someone for too long, Chip, you develop that. <laughs> Did I say too long? I meant a perfect amount of time. Do I say too long? I'm sorry. Um, he's, taking, he's taking this hole deeper there, right? <laughs> oh, oh, no, I dig that hole. He's going to be in it, though. <laughs> nice See, that, that, that was another question that you're kind of like, that. I was surprised by that answer. See, I... I knew you didn't get into this professionally because I read your bio and I posted your bio bio on Para Unity, but I, I didn't know that you didn't have that ability until that age because the other question I was going to ask was prior to um, working professionally, there wasn't any, you weren't doing readings, you weren't doing anything of, of the kind are investigating the paranormal in any shape, way, or form. I've done some things like at parties and things. People would ask me to do readings for them, and I read tarot cards. And so those were big when I was in college back in back in the days when dinosaurs roamed the earth. You know, so it's it's. Um, I've always been in some way connected to the paranormal or supernatural or spiritual realms, but but professionally, I did not start doing what I do professionally until two thousand one. God, you don't hear that. Yeah, Jane that's, Doherty. That's Jane no. Doherty yeah, did Jane it was later older in the, too, I mean, yeah. we're, we're finding out. Honestly, it's funny because it seems to me like the more really reputable ones and like the real authentic ones tend to be, like you said, you 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 come out and you're doing this as your older, more put together person. Yeah, see, see here's my thing. You know, I, I have a skeptic's brain. And, you know, as the paranormal has become more mainstream, mediums are a dime a dozen now. And, you know... Some people are like, I oh, I took a course and now I'm all of a sudden I, I knew someone from five years ago who never claimed to be a medium or have any abilities. And guess what? They're a medium now doing readings. And I'm just like, how does that happen? You know, so I, I've I met, well, I've met legitimate mediums in my life, but I know, like I said, there are some that truly have the gift and others are just kind of on that wave. I don't know how else to put it. <laughs> He'll tell you, I tend to get a lot of a lot of, of individuals that call themselves psychic mediums, readers, and they get really upset because I just don't rubber stamp them into events. They get really irate with me. But I feel it's my responsibility to be responsible to the other person on the other side of the table. And if John and I are going to say, these people are good people, you can trust us to trust to put someone in front of you that you can you get a reading from, then that's our responsibility to do it the right way. Right, right. So this was something interesting too that I read, Chip, that I didn't, um, you know, I put these bios together, but I should read them once in a while. So <laughs> I, actually, I actually read yours uh, last night and I didn't know this either. You were featured in a magazine called Fate and Fortune. Um, the article was about your visit to the ruins of 9-11 site with the widow of a, a woman of a man who died there. Could you, I didn't know anything about this. It Could blew you, John away when he Yeah, I had no idea because that's one of those places we talked about this that's kind of like, you know what I mean? It's kind of forbidden or taboo 
to really talk it's about. Too soon. I, I guess mm -hmm. it's still too soon. The wound is but so raw. How, what was that experience? How did it come to be? Could you walk us through that? And... Um, um, <clears throat> I would say that it was in March, February or, or March of 2002, and I was doing readings on a psychic hotline, like okay. a 900 number. That's how a lot of really, really well-known psychics and mediums got their start. Okay. But I was doing readings on a, on a psychic hotline, and one of the ladies that called me wanted me to do a spirit contact reading for her, and she gave me the, the man's name. I always ask for three pieces of information. The name of the person you want me to contact, the relationship you have with that individual, and how long it's been since they passed. Okay. And she told me that, she told me the man's name, she told me that was my husband, and he's been gone about six months or less. So I immediately knew that his death had something to do. The, I, the minute I focused in on him, I immediately knew that his death had something to do with 9-11. And the more I, I really focused in on it, I knew that he had died when one of the towers fell. And I gave her a reading without revealing too much about the, my client. Cause I, 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 talking to me is kind of like talking to a psychiatrist or a doctor or a priest. You know, I, I have a, I, I, I keep everything confidential. There's confidentiality right. involved. So, um, I picked up a whole lot of things about their life together, about their family, um, about how he died mm. and he had, he had been to give you some idea. He had, didn't work in the building. He was there for a meeting oh, at, at windows on the world yeah. and one of, at the top of one of the, the, the towers. And he, he, he didn't make it out. Oh, geez. Um, and I told her that, one of my goals at some point in time was to visit that site. Right. And at that point in time, there were, it, they were still clearing the area. Right. Um, and as, as fate would have it, it turned out I was going to be in the city within a few weeks after I talked to her on the phone. And she, I called her up and I said, she said, if you go to the site, I'll go, I'll go with you if you want me to. And she said, I have access to a very special place that over in, in a building nearby that overlooks the site. You can look down on the site and it's a room for family members of people who died at the trade okay. center only. Wow. So... When I found out I was going to go to New York, I called her on the phone and she said, um, yes, let's go. And at the hotel I was staying, we arranged to meet in the lobby of the hotel where I was staying at a specific time. And she met me at the hotel and we immediately fell into each other's arms and openly wept. Mm. Um, we, you're going to make me cry now, damn it. <laughs> um, we took a taxi down to the World Trade Center site. Right. And we went through some very strict security and she had to give them some sort of code or number or something to prove that she was a 9-11 a, a right. widow right. or family member. And we went up to this room and there was this huge bank of windows. And I remember... I remember walking with her toward the windows and immediately we just reached out and held each other's hands as we got closer to the windows. Oh my God. And as we walked over toward the windows, you could see down into the place where the bulldozers oh. were still bulldozing and they were the ruin of the building. Ugh. And both of us had tears streaming down our oh. face. And I remember saying, they're not here anymore. They're gone. They were, I believe that angels gathered and took, the souls of those who were killed. I'm getting like goosebumps as okay. you're saying this. I mean, I would love to believe that that was all true because those people, they deserved it for. Well, they died. They were innocents who died. Yeah. Yeah. And 
I remember I knew I was going to go to this place and one of the, I knew that there were, um, there were memorials hanging on every inch of the room. I mean, hanging all around pictures of the dead, prayers, rosaries, crucifixes, hanging all uh, religious, you know, anything religious, uh, stars of David. There were things, anything hanging around, around um, on the walls of this office suite where this memorial room was. And um, I'd gone out and I'd bought a St. Michael the Archangel prayer card and a St. Michael the Archangel medal. And I'd come equipped with that, with them. And, um, and he's uh, adhesive tape, uh, cellophane tape, scotch tape. And I took those things and I taped the St. Michael card and the medal on the window facing mm. the rooms of the trade center. And I remember, sorry. I remember getting down on my knees, looking down and just praying as hard as I could. Jesus. Hmm. And as you can see, it's been how many years now? 19 years almost. And it still affects me. That How day. could it not? And, and you know, what's really interesting is the lady that I... It's funny that now I have a dog that I got recently and her name is Abby and the lady that I'm talking about, her name is Abby. Uh, <laughs> but I talked to Abby on the phone not long ago, I would say within a year. And she's, I mean, she and her husband had two small children. Wow. And, you know, now they're living, they're living, she and her boys, one's in college and they're living in, um, in the Pacific Northwest. Okay. But she's doing okay. The last I talked to her, but here's the end of the story. And you know, this is going to get me again. Um, we left the building and um, walked outside and I said, so what would you do? If, um, and I call the man by name and I don't want to say his name. I don't want to right. exploit him. Right. But I said, what would you do if your husband was here right now? What would the two of you do? She said, we'd probably, because he worked in that neighborhood somewhere. Yeah. She said, we would probably go to Blimpy's <laughs> and get a Blimpy's Best special with a drink and chips and as a matter of fact, it's the one right over here. And she pointed, there was the blimpy. We'd go to this blimpy and we'd get a blimpy's best and a bag of chips and a soda. And we'd walk over and have lunch together in the park. And that's what she and I did. Oh, wow. Uh, that's, that's so heartbreaking. I mean, and you believe in that case where so many went at one time, they all, there's nothing that lingers there, right? Everything just transitioned right over to the other side. I I, I believe that, that God could have prevented that, but God right. puts us on a long leash. I think that people are asking about the coronavirus and why doesn't God do something about it? Right. You know what? I think God stands back a lot. I think God really stands back and says, what are you guys going to do? Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm going to intervene every now and then, but what are you guys going to do to make this better? And I think that's the thing. God doesn't always micromanage. You right. know, could, he, could he have saved that? I truly believe, yes, in my own belief system. God. But you do believe that. in miracles, right? I mean, you believe miracles. I absolutely okay. believe in miracles, but here's the deal. I don't think that God is going to stop war or famine no, no. Or, or, no. or wildfires or anything like that. I think God, you know how you've heard that that maybe we're some great, experiment right or like an ant farm right there's some truth to that oh yeah you're right because he he equipped us to not do these things and to stop them ourselves but here we go we just repeat the same things right, right. so and so god's not always god's not always going to step in right god's not always going to step in but do i believe that those souls were taken away yes 
No, I, I, believe that they were, I believe that they were swiftly snatched away from that location. So let's switch gears and, and talk about something um, a little different. You, you, I knew you. I come to know you from Paranormal State. Like I think the majority of your, your fans, um, I really enjoyed that show. You okay. were my favorite part of that show. Um, and Katrina, Katrina was great. Katrina in person, great person, another great person. Um, ask, her ask, ask Katrina next time you see her why I call her Cookie. Okay. <laughs> I'll have to remember that one. How did you become affiliated with that show? Because if, for those of you who don't know, um, Paranormal State was a show about college kids who formed a paranormal group and would go and inv- they'd get cases into the college. Was that Penn State, Chip? Yes. yes. And they would go investigate them. And, and on many of the cases, Chip was an advisor, was the medium that they used to assist them. How did you become affiliated with that show? I've been doing, some, do I've been doing some events around the country for a while. And um, Dave Schrader from Darkness Radio called me one day. Oh, wow. And he said, and, and now people know Dave from yeah, Holzer Files. From Holzer yeah. Files on Travel Channel. My network. My network. There you go. <laughs> wow. So Dave called me one day and he said, hey, there's this new show that's coming out soon. And it's called Paranormal You like Paranormal University. Okay. And that was the working title at that point in time for Paranormal State. And he said, there's this show coming out and they filmed a handful of episodes so far. Later found out they were, they had filmed eight so far and they're getting ready to film an episode and they've been using a psychic and a medium and they really want to mix it up a little bit. Would you be interested in having me, you know, throw your name into the, into the mix for that? And I said, sure. So I, we got off the phone and a little later that day, a, a, a gentleman who is still a lovely, beloved friend of mine working as an executive producer on the show, his name is David Miller. David called me on the phone and we chatted and he said, how do you do what you do? And I said, I, have, I don't have a clue. I don't know how I do what I do. I just do it. He said, how do you work? I said, how do you want me to work? I mean, <clears throat> you're, I don't have like a method. If you want me to walk through a location and give you my impressions, I can do that. Now, had you ever done any TV before then? I've done one thing in the paranormal arena and I've done a lot of stuff as, as a performer, as, okay. as an actor in the past, I've okay. done some television work and film TV and, and that, that, that side of the right. business. So um, he said, all right, well, you know, I'm going to have the guy who's the star of the show. His name is Ryan Buell and I'm going to have Ryan reach out to you. And I'm like, all right. And Ryan and I had communicated a couple of times on a message board. Remember the good old days of the message boards on? Oh, yeah. So Ryan and I communicated primarily because I'd noticed on on one of the paranormal message boards that he was from South Carolina. And I spent a lot of my growing up years in South Carolina as well. So we had just touched base a couple of times, exchanged a couple of pleasantries on that message board. So he called me on the phone and we chatted for a bit and, you know, he said, well, we'll let you know. And I thought, okay, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, no sweat off my you-know-what. <clears throat> and um, later that night, interestingly enough, a young man whose name is Dan Zarenkevich called me on the phone. And interestingly enough, now this is in, this is in January of 2007. Okay. And Dan Zarenkevich is now one of the producers on Kindred Spirits, the show. Oh, I'm wow. On. Okay. So well, that explains Dan, a lot. Dan, Dan called me on the phone. He worked production on Paranormal State. And he called me on okay. the phone. He goes, hey, Chip Coffee, this is Dan Zarenkevich, and I'm with Paranormal You. And I'm here. You're going to be on the next episode with us. So I'm calling to book your travel. I went, well, Dan... <laughs> And I said, well, damn, Dan, I'm the psychic and you know more than I do. Oh, my God. (laughs) So this was on, you know, I I said, you know, he called me on a Wednesday. All this happened on a Wednesday in January. And I said, well, yeah, I'd love to. And he said, okay. And I said, well, when are you thinking, when is the filming? When are you talking about? And I'm thinking maybe a couple of weeks, right? You would think maybe. Yeah, give you a little bit of a notice there. Friday. What? So I flew from my home in Atlanta on Friday to Philly 
Okay. And I drove for a couple of hours to a little town in kind of kind of an Amish country, a little bit close to Amish country called Elizabethtown. Okay. And that's where I did my first episode of Paranormal State. And you want to hear a little interesting something about that flight? I think it's a little different now. I think they've added a mile onto it when I got home. That was, of course, my, my first case with Paranormal State, and it was a demonic case. Oh, boy. And when I looked at my frequent flyer miles that I'd gained, that I'd accrued for flying to Philadelphia from Atlanta to Philly at that point in time, and they've changed it and added one mile since then, the number of miles from Atlanta to Philly was 666. <laughs> Talk about an omen. <laughs> now, you had told me, we talked about this before, your process was you didn't want to know where you were going. You didn't want to know the information. You just okay. wanted to go from the hotel to the place. Let me clarify that a little bit. Of okay. course, I know where I'm going. Okay. I have to have an airline ticket or I have to drive right. if it's close enough to drive. Right. So I know the city that I'm going to. Right. And but basically, that's all I know. They put me in a hotel. Sometimes it's in the hotel with with whoever the rest of the cast is. Sometimes it's a separate hotel. The cast and crew are, are, are told that if they run into me or they see me. They're not to speak about anything the the, the, the crew and the, the cast and crew go out of their way to keep me completely uh, uh, like unknowing about anything. Right. I don't know squat. When they, they, when they tell me if I'm driving myself to a location, they tell me, they tell me to meet them like a mile or so away from where I'm going okay. and in a parking lot. And that they send over the audio person who puts a mic pack on me there. And then when they're ready to start filming with me, they either come and, and and I follow them to the location or they tell me this these are the directions for where you're going. So when you see me pull up and and I get out of the car or what however I, I'm arriving, that's when I get there. Yeah. And I, you know, if you think about it, there's most places, even in the most remote areas, have numerous haunted locations. Uh, of course. Right. So I would have to be doing, I don't, but I would have to be researching and, and, and exactly and, and hope that you, yeah, yeah. On a hell of a lot of places <laughs> you might want to and, and hoping and hoping that I'm going to, you know, I, I'm going to pick the right one, you know? Well, that that's the thing is when you and I spoke about this and, and you were saying that um, just what you told me, you know, you knew the city, you knew the hotel and right. that's right. what you knew, but when you either someone drove you or you went to the location, you went in cold. And, well, and think about this, a lot of the places that we did on Paranormal State, the vast majority of them were homes. Right, that's and, what I'm saying. So you can't research. No press or anything with them. Yep. You know, so there was no way for me. Now, granted, I when I went to, like on Paranormal State, or not, or not Paranormal State, on Kindred Spirits, for example, when I was, you know, when they they asked me to come and do the episode at Belvoir Winery. I know the people there. I've been there a number of times, but it was a kind of a different circumstance. So absolutely, on that show, on that episode of Kindred, I knew exactly where I was going. And I mean, when when they brought me into Point Pleasant, West Virginia, I pretty much knew I was going to probably be going there for Mothman. Okay. I mean, and when they they, you know... But then again, they tricked the crap out of me on, on, um, on an episode on both episodes actually on Kindred of the Lizzie Borden stuff up in Fall River, Massachusetts. Because on the first episode, I said, "Oh, I will bet we're going to Lizzie Borden." And they went, "Oh, you're going to be real surprised then." And now I've been to Lizzie Borden, but I picked up on stuff at Lizzie Borden that I'd never picked up on before. Because quite honestly, the other times up there. I didn't go as an investigator. I didn't even tap into stuff. I just went as a tourist. And then when they brought me back the second time, I had I I I said, well, we can't be doing anything Lizzie Borden on this episode because we've already done Lizzie Borden for crying right. out loud. And then they blindfolded me and took me into where Lizzie moved and became Lizbeth over to Maplecroft, where she she moved after she left the house. So oh, wow. I'm like, you cunning little <laughs> suckers, you just tricked the crap out of me. Yeah, because a lot so, of people believe that the, that the the mediums are kind of fed. Because you know, 
you you work in the the production. They do their homework and they research or whatever. But that's why when I was talking to you, I wanted to get your insight, having done it. Uh, and I I love your approach and how you do it. And that makes it so much more <laughs> legit than you know. Here, Chip. Here's the address. And now in the age of Google and everything else, you could just you know what happened yeah, there. Yeah. You don't know the number of times that I felt like a leper because I've been excluded from things. Yeah. You know, I've sat in production vans and 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 eat, it, waiting to go inside a location and eaten so many cold meals out of styrofoam and sat there and waited and waited because filming got behind. And, you know, usually now on Kindred, Greta and I will fly in one day stay, yeah. and stay at the hotel, get our bearings. The next day, they'll call me to set to film. We'll film that day, that, that afternoon, evening, and into the evening. And then the next day, Greta and I fly home. Well, any episodes of um, Paranormal State that stand out to you that were, for whatever reason, that stand out above the others? You mentioned the I, first demonic one. That had to be something. It was. it was. And then there was the episode that was called Devil in Syracuse. The first episode was called, the, the title was The Name. Because I gave them a name of the demon that had been following Ryan around. Straight up. Wow. And then the next episode, he was there again. Showing up in Syracuse, New York. Um, those two episodes were pretty iconic. The other one that everyone remembers is because it, it, we, we did two episodes with the same family. It was the I Am Six episodes. With yeah, the, I remember with that the, one. With the exorcism with Laura. Um, most people know those. Actually, my... Probably the episode that impacted me the most was one called The Firehouse, shot in Jersey, actually, in Clementon. Okay. We shot at a fire station in Clementon, New Jersey. Really? And I watched that one. We saved the life of a fireman in that episode. What? I got to check YouTube, see if that's there. It's there. Do you ever feel like anything attached to you or you have the ability to kind of keep that off? My faith is so strong. My faith is so strong, and people most, I, I think, living and dead, know that if they f with me, I'm going to f back. But you believe? Do you do believe that a spirit could attach to a person? And if you're weak, if you have, if you have a, a weakness about you, it can attach. Yeah, I, I would, I would imagine that it can happen. Right. You know what? Um, I, if the question is, does it ever happen to me? I've had something follow me home once. Okay. But that's the only thing that's ever happened. Okay. Talking about Paranormal State, like, you know, they, re they reboot all these shows in some way, shape, or form. If they did a Ghost Hunters where they said, Chip, you're the guy, you're the medium on the show, we're going to have all new college kids. Would you do something like that? You mean if they yeah. rebooted, if you said Ghost Hunters? Paranormal State. Hunters. Did I? I said, I said like, like Ghost Hunters, the, the new oh, Ghost like Hunters. like they did with Ghost Hunters. Oh, okay. Right. Um. A whole bunch of new college kids and you. It depends. I, I, I'm not going to say no to any opportunity. Right now I'm under contract with Travel Channel and I'm very happy. Okay. Travel Channel. Let me just give Travel Channel a shout out. The people that are on Travel Channel and at the production company that does Kindred and that's Paper Root Productions. I... I am one of the luckiest guys on the face of the planet because they have treated me with such kindness and consideration and respect Wow! that I couldn't ask for anything better. You know, I am so happy to be a part of the travel channel family and to, to have the folks at, at paper Root productions as, you know, part of, part of the, the, the folks that I'm dealing with professionally, they're just, they're incredible, amazing people. I mean, from the outside looking in, it looks like travel is much better for the paranormal people and the, the shows that seems like they support the shows and, and the people pretty well. I, I, I there's, I, there's no, nothing I can say more than that, except they're wonderful. They've treated me so well. You so know, people, like, people like Matt Butler and, you know, people, Matt Butler, Liz Melcher, Matt Butler's the, 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 the managing person at the network. He's like the head honcho at travel. You know, Liz Melcher, who does, who does um, most of the talent relations and Julie Meisner Eagle, who's kind of second in command. And, and the, uh, you know, our, 
our executive producer who works with us on the show from the network. You know, all those people are just, they're, they're very nice people. And then there's all the folks at Paper Root. And, you know, I, I just say it again, I'm a really lucky guy to, to have those people working, to be working with those people. They've assembled, assembled a pretty good roster on that channel of, of people in the field who Absolutely. people want to watch, you know? So I, I do enjoy watching travel. And that's why we kind of bump things up because I know Ghost Nation and, you know, is coming on and travel's new premiere. <laughs> um, yeah, let's jump yeah, yeah. uh, Psychic Kids. How did that come to be? Did you enjoy that whole experience? Is that something you would do again in some way, shape, or form? Psychic Kid was a tough show to produce because you had to deal with multiple families on one episode. Right. Um, getting the kids and the parents available to be, if you were filming during the school year, parents taking time off work, kids <laughs> taking time off school, you know, getting, getting everything together logistically was kind of a nightmare for the production crew. Um, it was a very rewarding experience right. to be on the original um, incarnation of Psychic Kids. Um, I, I, I love being a part of that. I think we did things that are very valuable. It's one of the, it's one of the things people say to me the most. I love that Psychic Kids show. I love. I like that show Kids. a lot. I would, you know, I wish they would bring it back, and they did bring back a reboot right. of the show, but it was a very different format. Yep. It was, a very, it was very different format from the original. So would I do it again? Probably not. Okay. <laughs> but how was that experience for you as far as, you know, you had mentioned you, you didn't get your ability as far as the mediumship until later on. Was it weird for you seeing children so young that had that ability? No. no. Because, because you could replace psychic, the word psychic with, obese or heavy set or kids right, with right. glasses right. You know, kids that were made fun of or misunderstood or whatever there's a lot of reasons gay children or right. children now that are, are gender fluid right. whatever words you want to use there's 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 a lot of reasons for for kids especially and even older folks to to suffer at the hands of being misunderstood or maligned and those kids were just going through some things that they didn't understand. And I think I, as an adult grew to understand those things. I, I went through some of the, I never was made fun of as a kid for being psychic. Right. But then again, you didn't have the internet then you didn't have television. <laughs> you didn't have all the yeah. things. Totally I, different world. No, the world is, well, we had television then. I don't want to make myself older, but we didn't have shows necessarily that were showing you things about the psychic right. realm. You had, you had, you know, shows like twilight zone and outer limits but they were showing you the horror aspects of it, yep. moreover. Like you said, you could be bullied 24-7 now. It's no longer, you know, just in school. Now that you have all access for these poor kids that are bullied. Well, I like you know? the fact that it opened doors, whether anyone wants to talk about it. Do it like opening that door in Psychic Kids made it for younger people to be able to talk about their experiences, yeah. their gifts. I had a, a father of a child, a power unity, approach me and said, I saw Chip at a diner. My daughter is having type of ability that I don't know what's going on. He said, he walked right over to you and you talked to him for like a half hour and talked to his daughter. I think that was awesome. You know, it, 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 it's, and I will try to do that whenever possible. You know, a, a lot of times at events like your wonderful event at, at Para Unity, I don't know that that's the correct place because, you know, it, it, call me and make a consultation appointment with me. I'll yes. gladly talk to you on the phone about this where you've got me all to yourself. Right. But at an event like that, you know, to get into to really taking a good, cold, hard look at a certain circumstance, that's difficult when you know you've got a line of people that are wanting to come to you and shake your hand and say yeah. hello and, and get a signed picture or whatever. So I, I think timing is a good thing. It, it, there are certain times in everybody's life because even those of us who are on TV, we're human beings too. And, you know, if we're out having breakfast or something or dinner and, you know, we, we really are there with our friends and on our own private time. And I don't mind people coming over and asking for a photograph or an autograph or to say hello, but make it quick and, right. and, and be respectful of the fact right. that, that we're, we're there 
on our off time too. Had a lady, and you'll get a kick out of this. I was doing, I mentioned the episode of Kindred's or of a paranormal state that we did called, um, why, why did the name just go out of my mind? Am I, the, <laughs> the, one, the one with the girl with the exorcist, the, the exorcism, right. whatever the name of that show was, and it went out of my head. Um, but I'm sitting having a hamburger at in Illinois someplace at um, at a steak and shake. And this woman sitting there with a kid and she comes over and plops herself down and starts talking to me about paranormal state and, and this and this and something oh else. Oh my God. And sat there for the entire, <laughs> and talked my ear off for the entire time I'm eating. Yeah. And I mean, like, that's gotta be and, the worst I, part I didn't about. I want to be rude and say, you yeah, know, yeah. ma'am, it's nice that you stopped by and said hello, but I, I, I need a little me time now. And I probably would do that now, but do yeah. it nicely and go, um, I appreciate it. But I, you know, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to ask you to to to, to scoot on now, because I, I I'm kind of on my time now. So we've said hello. We've had a little conversation. So bye bye. That's got to be the worst part of being in the public eye is that, like you said, you can't go into a Shake Shack and just have a burger and you know a soda without people wanting to come up and tell you all their stories about their who's past and. You know what I mean? Uh, I I did that to Steve Gonzalez in um, Dunkin' Donuts, so I can't talk. <laughs> I cornered the poor guy, and I just wouldn't leave him alone. Um, you mentioned private readings. People aren't aware. Do you still do those? Absolutely, I do private readings. I do and all how does someone go about booking them? I do all my private readings by phone, which is really handy now that you can sit in the privacy of your own home while we're all hopefully sheltering in place and and uh, helping us to, to uh, s slow this virus thing down a bit and, and keep people, uh, including ourselves, safe. Um, go on my website at chipcoffee, C-H-I-P-C-O-F-F-E-Y.com. I click on the tab that says private readings. Read the information on there. Call the number, book an appointment, pay for the reading, and, I'll, and we'll get you set up. And I'll call you and we'll do a reading. Because I, I don't I, think people know that you do that still. I, I think... Right. I think a lot of people think that I'm an investigation psychic or medium right. only. And I do private readings. I absolutely do private readings. And, you know, I do three kinds of readings. I do either general readings, a psychic reading, which is all about the person, past, present and future, things like relationships and romance and career and finances and family relationships, whatever. And then I do another type of reading, which is a spirit communication reading. And unlike other mediums, I I don't do open channeling, which is allowing anyone that wants to the chance to come through. I do direct connect where you tell me who you want me to reach out to. And I try to reach out to that. Individual See, I like that. I, oh. I, that's yeah, that's different. I don't think I've ever heard people doing that. And the third type of reading I do is a combination of both. Okay. You know, I have a question again, it's not on our, our list here, but it's just for my own knowledge. Um, when people let, like Adam and Amy, like on a show like that, when, when you're in a building, let's say um, the uh, uh, Ohio prison, whatever, when they're openly communicating, outwardly <laughs> communicating to spirits, are they talking to just the spirits within that building? Or when you communicate, are you talking to whoever's listening? Here's Is that too part of a question? No, I think that's a very valid question. And I think it's one that's, that, from my perspective, is misunderstood a lot. Okay. Here, here's the deal. We're alive and we've got a body and we, our soul is inside of our body. That's my right. belief. So when we die, we don't have a body anymore, but our soul right. is free to roam wherever it wants to. So since we don't have a body, we're very mobile. We can go anywhere we want to. So just because I'm in Ohio State Penitentiary or Mansfield Reformatory, whatever, right. if I'm in that building, if I'm in Shawshank, right. the deal is, I, I may be communicating with someone who's either been incarcerated there or worked there or had a family member that worked there, or I could be talking to somebody who's there for the event and brought a, a, a hitchhiker, somebody oh. along with them. Okay. I could be talking to somebody that just because we're there talking to dead people and trying to call them up that they're, Oh, they're from a hundred miles away or a thousand miles away and just floating in. So, so you don't believe that spirits can be stuck in a location? I believe that they <clears throat> they can, but here's what I also get asked a lot. Think about this, John. 
you go into a cemetery and you think you're going to, that's going to be a very haunted place, right? right? If you died today, God forbid, would you stay, hang out in the cemetery? If I thought my family was going to come visit me, I may zap so in and out. Stay, so, John, you're going to stay in the cemetery all no. the time. On the, no, on the no way. Your family's going to come visit. <laughs> no, no way. No, you're not. No. My mother died in a hospice center, an inpatient hospice center. My dad okay. died in a VA hospital. Okay. They're not hanging out there hoping that I'm going to come back to that location. No, you're right. My you're mother right. showed up in Australia when I was in Australia. What? Yeah. Yes. Here's the deal. Dead people can, it doesn't have to be anybody that has anything to do with the location. Because when you're there, if you go on an investigation, and both of you have investigated a lot, right? Yeah. And probably many of the people watching this have investigated a lot. Right. So here's the deal. If you go into a place, we're out looking to communicate with the dead, correct? Yeah. So basically what we're doing is we're dialing them up, we're conjuring them up, we're calling them out. Right. So they may not be somebody who's hanging out there all the time, but they hear us calling them up and they go, eh, we'll go over and chat with these guys. Hmm. See, I've asked others about that because I was always curious about that too. Are you opening up the line to all or just local? You yeah, know, yeah. Do, you, do you, I've heard from others. And again, I'm more curious to this personally because of losing my mom recently. Do you believe that there is a transition time? I hear that a lot from mediums. Well, is there, yeah, between here and there, there's a time period of where they're what in limbo or they're being judged or like, what's think about this. Here's an analogy. Okay. All right. So you get a phone call and your job says, we're transferring you to Seattle. We'll All just right. pull Seattle out. So you got to pack your crap up. You got to get across country. You got to get into your new place. You got to unpack, get settled in, find your grocery store, find your dentist, find your doctor, meet new people, get settled into your job. It's really kind of the way it is with dying also. Really? You got to go you got to go to the, this new place. You're you're you you you've gone to a totally new new place of existence. Right. You got to get your bearings. And huh. especially if you've died a traumatic death or you've been very sick, we're mind, body and spirit, right? That's right. that's the holistic approach, mind, body, spirit. So your your body doesn't exist anymore. You don't have that shell for your soul, but you do have your mind, which is your consciousness, and you do have your spirit, which is your soul. So no. when you go there, if you've been sick, that means that, that your sickness in this life probably has also taken a toll on your, your spirit and your soul or your spirit right. and your consciousness. Okay. So lots of times you do have to kind of do what I call soul reintegration. You have to heal your soul a bit, your energy. Think of it as energy. You have to heal your energy a bit. And if you die a traumatic death, imagine if all of a sudden you were God forbid again, struck by lightning and it killed you. Right. And all of a sudden you're sitting right where you're sitting and lightning strikes you. And then, and then all of a sudden you're dead. You're like, how the F did this happen? Imagine this. Imagine you're sitting where you're sitting right now and then you blink. And in the next instant, you find yourself sitting under the Eiffel Tower in Paris. You're yeah. like, what yeah, how did I get here? What happened? do I do now? Yeah. What the hell just happened? I get it. I mean, get one it. minute he's sitting here on the sofa, the next minute he's in a hole in the backyard. One yeah. second later. Yeah. You know, and here's the deal. You so it's 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 all about it's all about an energetic shift. It's about consciousness. And and I, I believe that that all those things I don't begin to understand it all, and I'm just right. tossing out my own beliefs. Right. But this is what I've come to believe in and and having been around this crazy field since I was a child and doing it professionally for going on 19 years. No, I, I like that explanation a lot. It makes a lot more sense to me than what I heard, just general. People just say transition, and I go, what is, what what is that? that? Are we talking yeah. about purgatory? Like, what are we talking about here? Because I have a shot at purgatory. I know I'm going to be in there a little while, but I'm a little disturbed by the psychic so media. What you're going to get is you're, you're going to run the risk of, if you've done some things that you've got to take accountability or responsibility for, you may go to spirit and the, and loving beings over there may give you a good old fashioned ass kicking. But I, I don't think that, you know, I believe that only the, those souls that are, are judged as irredeemable 
are going to go to a dark place if they're not able to be rehabbed. Right. So last question. I want to ask a question oh, go too. Ahead. Sorry. My, my one question I want to put out there, Chip, what is something you can tell all of us that we'd be surprised to know about you that we don't? She was dying to ask you this. What would you be surprised to know about me? I think I put it online before, but I'll tell you this. I have a, I have what's called nyctophobia, which is a phobia of the dark. What? Yeah, 100%. Seriously? <laughs> and you do all those episodes of the TV show and... I, I, think I, I, I have I have an unrealistic, well, I don't know, it's not so unrealistic to me, but I have this immense fear of the dark. Yeah. I don't like I don't like pitch black dark. Yeah. My house at night where I'm sitting in my house right now, my house, there's night lights all over it. I, I have an ensuite right, a bathroom. There's a bathroom off my bedroom and I sleep with the lights on in the bathroom that, wow. that and there's night light, like I said, night lights all through my house. Um, when I was in college, I, maybe this is because I grew up in the haunted house and right. crap happened all the time. But I, I, until I was in my 20s, I slept with my bed in my bedroom with a 100 watt light bulb on in my bedroom. <laughs> you had the sun in there with you. John will tell you, <laughs> when he moved in here, it drives him crazy that all my shades are completely closed in my house. I never have my shades open. I have a fear. Well, I've been stalked and, you know, things have happened. So it took me a while and I'd come out and the windows would be open. He'd have them open. And it's taken me, what, a year and a half to get used to it and get a little more comfortable with it. Yeah. I deal with a lot, Chip. But I, I've been called to say, I don't know if that's true or not. But um, last question, Chip, um, besides kindred spirits, what, what other things are you, I know you did those interviews. What were they? The pajama? I did, I did. Par paranormal pajama party. Yeah. You're you're not doing those anymore, or just waiting? there's several there's several more that are waiting to be released, and right now we're just waiting to see exactly how how what the response to those are going to be. So there's still I think four of those left to 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 uh, be released by. And where, can we, where can we find the ones that you did? Um, if you go, they're on um, Amazon Prime Video under my okay. name. If you put in my name, it'll pull them up. There's three of them on. Um, and you can also go to viddy.space, okay. which is an internet site. Not viddy.viddyspace.com. It's viddy.space. Okay. Um, and find them there. Um, what else is coming up? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. I know. That, he tells me that all the time. But uh, He'll help me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a psychic medium tell me I might die tomorrow and I might get struck by lightning. You heard him. So I, I got to be, I was afraid of this Corona. Now I got to be afraid of lightning. Chip, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chip, for doing this. I can't tell you how much it means to me and how much your friendship means to me. And um, I'm happy to have met you. I'm happy that we have this friendship. And I, I hope you take care of yourself and remain safe and healthy. I and that. Ditto and right I, back at you. I hope you guys remain safe and, uh, you know, um, fingers crossed we'll see each other in September that things, will, be, th things will not be crazy but if they are we'll be alive and we'll see each other whenever it happens and we will, we will. And our, go our goal is we should tell everybody that's a big fan of New Jersey Para Unity it's going to happen but it's we're, happen. we're wanting to keep everybody safe exactly. we're exactly. wanting to keep everybody safe and nobody gets sick we're wanting everybody to, to have a lovely time Exactly. And be alive to come for years and years and years in the future. And that's the goal. And be and able to the... shake hands and take photos exactly. and talk to each other, right? And Safely. Hump, and hump my leg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, people. On that note. <laughs> Have a good night, Chip. Thanks again. Talk Thanks, to you guys. soon. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon, John. All right. Take care. Bye, Bye guys. So, um, that's it for Chip. Um, thank you all so much for watching. Uh, we appreciate it again. We're New Jersey Paranormal. I'm John. This is Chris. We, we've done interviews with John Zaffis, um, Dustin Parry. We're going to have an interview with Scott Porter coming up. We're going to do interviews with a lot of paranormal people in the field about different subjects. So please come back and join us if you can. Uh, other than that, thank you again for watching. Stay safe. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again. Take care, everyone. Have a good, have a good night, night, everybody.